Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back to Celebrating Act 2 with our special guest, Dave Samuels, who's the founder and chief investment officer of Corinthian Wealth Management. Uh, welcome back, Dave. And th thank you, by the way, this has been a fascinating series of uh, conversations that we've had sharing your perspective as a, an advisor, not as a sales rep of a, of a product, but an advisor sure. on how people can get the most out of their estate and their planning. So thank you uh, uh, before we uh, get to this next pillar, but uh, thank you so much for sharing your uh, knowledge with us. Uh, sure. Dave, um, I, I, we've gone through the four of the five pillars of financial planning. And this is the last one, this is the last basic element of financial planning, uh, investments. And it seems to me that it was or is the sexiest uh, of the bunch. Uh, everybody talks about the stock market. Everybody talks about investments and real estate and whatever it else. And, and yet uh, you put it last, maybe I'm guessing because we want to take a more sober approach to it. We don't really want to look at investments as sexy, as a game, as a, uh, a you know, a contest. We want to take a very serious approach to it. Am I on track there? Yeah, I think you are. So, John, I'm going to stretch out what you just said. I like to view investments as asking, what is your intent? Why are you investing? Are you saving for retirement? Are you a speculator? Are you maybe have some short term quick goals? Are you some people will have competitions with their buddy? And that's kind of rare, but I've seen that. So what is your intent? Why are you doing it? And the second question that, that which we take from the first is what is your time horizon? If you're saying, hey, I want to get in and get out, you're probably a speculator or a day trader. And obviously, those are folks that are not our typical clients. What we look for and most people have, I hope, is more of a long-term outlook. It is And long-term for us is three, four, five years on out, where the goal is to accumulate wealth as and make money. But at the same token, be aware the market's going to go in various cycles. It's going to go up. It's going to go down. It's going to go sideways. We know it's going to do those things. We just don't know when. So again, between your intentions and your time horizon, those are the two first steps we questions we want to answer as we move forward. Hmm. So it, it, investments is a big word. Um, we just threw out uh, stock market and, and uh, real estate. What other categories of investments are there? Uh, oh, significant. I mean, the stock market, of course, stocks, bonds, funds. I mean, stock market entails, boy, you can go any place because you can buy a stock or a fund that represents something else. Even Bitcoin is coming up as an investment. You can invest in insurance companies. So that's pretty broad based. Some people will invest and say, hey, I, they call themselves real estate investors. They're investing in real estate direct. That's not our specialization. That's where you go to realtor for. <clears throat> Some people invest in maybe fine art. Again, these are tangible investments that people are buying a specific product or something that they invest in. Uh, we like to view the stock market as a looking for specific goals and back to your intention as a long term savings plan for retirement. And once you've retired to have that wealth you've accumulated to at least live off of and be able to use to make your retirement more comfortable. Good, so uh, good point. I, I noticed that I noticed that um... Uh, but by the way, I appreciate the fact that investments is last because uh, perhaps they're, uh, if you've paid attention to all the other objectives of estate planning and wealth management and taxes and things like that, then you, you could probably take a more sober look at investments, whether they are um, uh, in the stock market or in, uh, in real estate. Uh, I know some people who own three or four homes that they rent, and that's that's part of their retirement plan. Uh, it wasn't necessarily, it was like to supplement income along the way, but then, especially with the rising prices of houses. But one thing that you did talk about, 
and I don't. It's only because it's not the specific subject matter of uh, uh, John or myself or a client. Is people who invest in a business that they own and continue with that because maybe it's either to hand off to a, a, a child or uh, just to increase the business uh, that could be sold off someday. Uh, are those investments that you talk to people about as well, as, either as an alternative, as a primary investment, uh, as part of their strategy? Okay, so Art, what I believe you're referencing is, in our world, we might call it a version of a private placement, non-publicly traded. Some people even do limited partnerships. Mm -hmm. Someone who owns a business, invests in their business, they know their business better than anyone. And hopefully they're making a sound, you know, they're doing things correctly and they're talking to their accountant, uh, maybe their attorney and other close advisors say, here's my business, here's what it's doing. But that's non-publicly traded. A, a outside investor, typically we're going to guide them more to, I'm going to call it traditional publicly traded investments that, that are liquid. So for example, maybe we'll buy part of our portfolio will include uh, something that mimics the S&P 500. Why would we do that? It's low cost, it's liquid, it's easy to follow, uh, and you can really you get a value every day, every second of the of the day if you'd like to. So we're guided more toward once again things that are publicly traded versus privately traded or what's called alternative investments. Mm. Yep, I can see that. It that makes sense. It seems to me that uh, as a fiduciary, a certified uh, financial planner, um, you are not a stock broker. You're an investment advisor. Is that a, a good term? Yeah. So, John, you're, you're dating me here. Uh, back in the day, we'll call it the 90s, it was very common for people to have a stock broker. You get the tip of the day or a phone call. Hey, you got to sell this stock and buy this stock. Well, that from the broker's perspective, it was a commission going in and a commission going out. From the um, client's perspective, well, maybe it was a good call, maybe it wasn't. Um, it got it can get kind of wild because that's, that was fairly speculative. The bar for disclosure was very low and it was just, the retirement was really not something that was a serious consideration there. I mean, the big big hope was you make a serious killing on some of your investments, sock the money away, and have a good life. Well, in came that changed when fee-based planning really took off. And fee-based planning started coming, and I'm gonna say it was around, but very rare. It came, it got really big after the tech wreck from 2000 to 2002. More of advisors of us then started saying, hey, you know, rather than flipping stocks around for commissions, Let's focus more on funds that we call them then no load, meaning no commission going in, no commission going out, just charge a fee. And to this day, we feel that's probably a better model for planning for retirement because we can recommend a stock or bonds or cash or exchange traded funds, mutual funds, whatever it is. And our payout is the same. The fee is flat. It's like your attorney giving you advice. Well, depending upon what the attorney tells you to do, that attorney's fee is the same. The same with your accountant. When you do your taxes, you may owe taxes, you may get a refund. That accountant has a flat fee, and we're the same way. We want our fee to be flat, therefore we don't have a, a hidden agenda to push in something versus something else because someone is getting a higher payout. Yeah. I've had experience with a broker who I thought was the greatest guy in the world until he put me into a fund that was essentially a high commission for him. And it was the fund created by the brokerage, you know, national chain mm -hmm. brokerage and uh, went south pretty quickly. <laughs> and John, those are called proprietary funds. So whatever entity you, your money is with, if you're with the ABC entity and they try to sell you the ABC fund, probably is proprietary, meaning they issue it, that fund. And yes, they're going to make a higher commission on it. And back in the day, what you didn't know, you probably helped your broker win a sales contest or a trip to Hawaii. He probably didn't tell you that. Uh, but that was that was how things were done then. Those days, I'm going to say, are pretty much gone 
because it's just out there in the public and it's been in the news for and the brokerage industry has cleaned up quite a bit with compliance and the different regulatory agencies coming down on the type of behavior. It probably still exists, but not nearly like it was in the 90s. Yeah. So uh, getting uh, back to our audience and investments in general, uh, can you provide perhaps some general advice on uh, people? And let's let's just frame it as 50 and above. So they are maybe not not quite at retirement or they're or maybe they're even in retirement. What is uh, what would you say are the basic things I should do when considering investments in in something that they uh, uh, have this precious capital that they let's say accumulate over a period of time to preserve it and perhaps have it last as long as possible? Do you have some general advice you can give them? Yeah, well, of course. So number one, we're always recommending no what you are paying. You say, what does that mean? If someone's trying to put you in something that is a commission, know what the commission is. For example, you have $500,000 and someone wants to put it in a series of mutual funds that charge commission, well, they should tell you what the commissions are, 3%, 4%, whatever it is. Then you can do the math and realize how much you're paying in commissions. Or if an advisor is charging you a fee, ask them, what is your fee? Is it a half a percent? Is it 1%? You want to know that. The second part of the cost that is critical that is finally coming to the surface is what are the internal costs? You say, what do you mean internal costs? All mutual funds and exchange traded funds, some people call them ETFs, have internal costs. They're super low costs when people do what's called indexing, as in copying an index as in the S&P 500 or the total market. I've seen those costs down to like 0.002%. It's like nothing. Other, other funds, mutual funds, charge over one and a half to two percent. So you want to know your internal costs, and it's important to ask that advisor. They should put it in writing. Because think, your total costs as an investor so far are your advisor fee, it's either a commission or a straight fee, and number two, these internal costs. The third cost, which is pretty much, I'm going to say almost gone away, or gone away quite a bit, is the transaction cost. So for example, if your money is at ABC, ABC is holding your money, they may charge a transaction cost to buy and or to sell. Now there's a lot of funds that you can buy or sell or purchase that don't have these transaction costs and your advisor or your custodian platform will give you a list of those. So we try to use those and we do our best to keep fees on the low end, which has actually gotten much easier to do. Easier to do. So John, the short answer to your question is keep your fees down and you got to know what they are. What's really helped keeping fees down is the concept of indexing, I alluded to it. And again, that's say, I'm going to track an index. What's an index? S&P 500, the total market, the NASDAQ, a bond fund. Those are indexes that are often very low cost and are frankly simple to track because they just have a manager copying what an index is doing. And often those indexes will outperform a fund that's what's called actively managed. And those are those are what's called liquid, so they're easy to get in and out of. And by the way, liquid means you can buy and you can especially sell with no holding period, no penalties, fees, or costs. Of course, your cost might be you pick a bad day to sell, the market's down, and of course you gotta pay your taxes. Those are costs we all incur. But beyond that, you don't want the funds to tack on extra costs to that. One last thought for you about um, uh, investments, and that is, uh, as a financial advisor, uh, a certified financial planner, I'm sure you help us determine what our investments are doing for us. I'm thinking of income, quite frankly. You know, am I am I expecting to get dividends from from this investment uh, on a regular basis, monthly, yearly, whatever, or am I looking for it to double in three mm -hmm. years because it's a brand new product and I don't know, electric cars are going to be everywhere in three years. So, John, what we always do is we build a portfolio. We're going to run it by you and not so much give you projections, but say, here's how it's done in the past. 
with your ups and downs, dividends, interest, all that. So I don't want to, I mean, it's a stretch to say you're going to kind of know what to expect, but we want to be real clear that here are the ups, here are the downs, here's a portfolio, here's a mix of stocks, bonds, and cash. And I use the word stocks. That includes mutual funds, no load, and exchange traded funds. So we're going to give you a report showing we can show you past performance. Of course, there's no guarantee to the future, but it gives you an idea to what to expect. Then I won't get the phone call saying, hey, Dave, the S&P over the last three months went up 10%. I went up 7.1. What happened to my money? Well, John, we didn't put all your money in the S&P 500 because that's getting more aggressive than you said you wanted to be. You said you wanted you, know, you want a portfolio that ebbed and flowed versus peaked and then tanked. So that's the cost of smoothing things out with diversification. You're not going to get all the ups, but you're not going to get all the downs. And then we have independent reporting systems that we can easily display. Hey, here's what you got. Here's your asset allocation as in stocks, bonds, and cash. Here's the income that has paid out previously. And it'll help us to move forward and have realistic expectations. That's a good point, Dave. Uh, it really goes back to our last video that we did together about risk management. Um, you can choose investments that are, quote, aggressive or, quote, conservative or, yes. you know, somewhere in between. Um, and you can choose uh, your risk, if you will, because more aggressive generally means more risk. Um, and it goes back to what I was thinking in, when we first did these uh, five pillar videos, and that is that it's all a balance. Um, you, you know, all five pillars are a balance. You're, as a certified financial planner, you're helping us with our financial plans using all five of these pillars, all five of these elements of, of finance. Um, this has been very, very, very useful. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you, Art. Always a pleasure to be with you. Now, before we let you go, your firm is uh, Corinthian Wealth Management. Yes. You're in the Bay Area of California, is that correct? Yeah. Yes. But you have clients, I assume, that because it's not something you need to sit in the same office, you have clients all around the country who you work with online or by telephone? Yes. So, John, um, up until I'm going to say the last five to seven years, we really wanted people to be here and come in the office. I still prefer it. I'm old school. Um, but we have more clients to say, hey, let's get on the computer, let's get on Zoom, let's get on email. They're okay with that. So we do have clients across the country that, that we counsel. And as you know, it's pretty easy to say, hey, what's the performance? Here, hang on the line. Let me forward you this performance report. Well, what happened here? What is this money coming out? Where's my deposit? So those basic questions we'd answer up front and in person are easy to answer if we're both looking at the same report online at the same time. So the answer to you, yes, we have clients all over. Most of our clients, I'm going to say, are home-based here, but we do have them throughout the country. And, also, and one for, last for, audit. John, the, for our audience, uh, uh, the uh, uh, link to the Corinthian Wealth Management uh, website will be in the description below. So if you wanted to find out, uh, even if uh, you just wanted to find out more about their company without even speaking to anybody, uh, it's a very interesting website to visit, and I recommend that everybody go there, take a poke around. They can always contact Dave. Yes, and, and I, I might have mentioned this before, or maybe not, but we always do the free consultation. Because mm -hmm. if someone is considering working with us, we want to make sure it's going to be a fit. And that can be, some people drop in for a person to her person visit. Some people go over the phone, some go over Zoom, but we want to spend that time so by the time that conversation is complete, um, our potential client's going to know who we are, what we do, and the key is, is this a fit? Because at the end of the day, our, you have to be comfortable. This has to work for you. Yeah, I was going to say, David, it does seem that the, um, the, the most important value for the client is really an ongoing relationship uh, where they can utilize your services, your knowledge, your advice, uh, as life changes, you know, I, how many times a year would you meet with somebody? I guess it varies. It depends it's on the person. It's going to vary, you know, a few times a year. 
it depends on the client. Some clients will call and say, let's do a review. And the younger one especially say, hey, I got a few minutes, what's up? Meaning they're telling me, the big question is, has anything changed in your life? Remember, I don't care about the stock market when I phrase that question, it's them. The stock market is always changing. But I want to know what's different for them. If it's nothing, <clears throat> great, then we'll, you know, we'll get them to go into the review. I like to make, maintain communication you know, at least a few times a year. O older clients, um, as they get in the 70s and 80s, tend to like more, let's take it slow and easy, get some hand-holding in, relax. But they're also very good because they've seen it all. Stock market going through the roof, the stock market crashing. They, <laughs> a lot of them they handle it well. I'm impressed. <laughs> well, Dave, this has been a wonderful adventure for Art and I and our audience, mm. the Celebrating Act Two audience. Um, not only meeting you and learning about uh, financial planning in general, but the specifics of these five pillars have been very helpful. And of course, you know, it all applies to us individually differently, right. different from person, uh, differently person to person. But this has been, uh, without any question, a very useful series of videos. So uh, right. we thank you. Right, thank and you eventually, so eventually uh, uh, our audience will be able to go in and we're gonna have a little playlist so that they can uh, go back and they can binge watch the uh, right. first interview yeah. and then the five master classes that uh, you so uh, 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 nicely shared with all of us. And, sure. uh, and then they can go back and check on the particular ones and uh, then decide if uh, uh, they want to, maybe it'll give them some ideas to work on their own or uh, uh, find somebody like yourself, perhaps yourself, as a certified financial planner and uh, get their uh, wealth that they have accumulated under control so that they can have a easier, happier, freer time going into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.